Hi everyone, I'm Ariel Adams. This is Spending Time, the Block to Watch podcast. I'm with a very special guest, uh, Mr. Ben Saunders. Um, ben, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we have some interesting guests on the show for sure. Ben is a very different kind of one because you are a polar explorer. We've never had a polar explorer on the show. I've actually never spoken to a polar explorer <laughs> um, in an interview, and I... And I had to do, you know, I had to think to myself, like, what is it that you ask a polar explorer? And I, re- I realized uh, I've never been to the poles. Uh, should I or should I not want to go to where you've been? That's a that's something that I want to know. Oh wow, um, that's a tough question. I mean, in some ways, in some ways, they are, um, you know, the high Arctic and Antarctica, the least hospitable places on Earth. They can be um, hellishly tough. Uh, places to, to, to try to exist. Dangerous, so, super dangerous. So, yeah, so 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 I, I think I think this is one of the things that's kept me going back. You know, seventeen years, twelve big expeditions. Now, I think I think it's the sort of highs and lows that you go through. So so on the one hand, they they've got the, the least to recommend them. They are they are they can be you know incredibly harsh environments, um, the coldest places on earth. But uh, but when it's good, it's really good. Um, and I th- I think that's what makes it. Uh, um, probably borderline addictive. There, there, there's something about these places, I mean, particularly Antarctica. My last two expeditions, um, on a good day, especially especially um, when you've got some scenery. Yeah, most of it is is, is blank white nothingness. But uh, especially around the mountains near the coastline, it can be absolutely stunning. Um, so I, I, I would recommend them, but I'm I'm biased. <laughs> is this kind of like space where you have to be very wealthy to even go there? I mean, obviously not as much as space, but is is you know the Arctic or the Antarctic places which are accessible to people. Like I don't even know this information. Yeah, I mean, I, I've chosen the most expensive way of going camping for sure, w- w- without without actually leaving the atmosphere. So um, the space analogy is a good one. I, I I think in some ways I am a frustrated astronaut, and and uh, and these places are the closest. I've experienced to uh, to visiting a different planet. You know, and and to me that again that's part of the appeal is the the extremity. You know. I, I often think if you're, you know, speedo swing trunks and and, and you dropped in the parachute into the hottest desert or the or the deepest jungle, you'd survive for a, for a, for a day or two, you know. But um, Antarctica, you know, in sort of early spring when it's in the negative forties Fahrenheit, you know, if if you were parachuted in, in a pair of speedos, you'd be dead in a few minutes. So so there's something to me. There's something extraordinary about being able to survive and, and to to operate in these places for for weeks, months at a time. Um, completely self-reliant you know completely reliant on on the little life support system that i'm you know what it sounds like it sounds like you're describing an extreme sport do you feel like you're sort (laughs) of an extreme athlete yeah i do i do and 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 that's why i always struggle with my job description you know explorer sounds like i'm in the wrong century it sounds kind of edwardian and and, and clearly I'm, (laughs) i'm not trying to discover you know i'm not trying to find out where the south pole is or the north but that, that that's all been done so so i definitely see these things as as uh, you know i definitely see myself as an unusual form of, of athlete and these in some senses these are kind of ultra 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 endurance challenges you know back in 2013 i did 69 marathons back to back in antarctica so so to me that's the that's the biggest part of the appeal why do people pay to have you do this let's i mean let's get intellectual i'm glad that they do i'm glad that you know ben is a bremont brand ambassador uh land rover uh intel has supported you like these are mm-hmm. these are admirable companies that you know have good decision makers they have decided that this type of trek is worth it tell me what's what's your pitch to them well it's it's a challenging one yeah and, and i've been with land rover for uh, for nearly a decade now and um and i remember when i when i first sort of was was trying to get a foot in the door of that with them the the, the the big challenge was that i wasn't actually going to be using their vehicles on my on my expedition so that was a that was a hard sell but um they've been a fantastic partner for for yeah nearly 10 years now and um in some senses they're a brand that's that's always had a, a, a you know this 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 deep connection with exploration and and, and you know, human human endeavor so um to me that was the that was the pitch and um and i've been lucky enough to 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 work with with brands that I would buy from anyway, and it's a pretty, you know, I mean, what car would an explorer drive? It's it's an obvious one, you know. Yeah. So, so. That, that, that's a, that's so. an easy partnership for you. Exactly, you can always exactly, justify yeah. it every single yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. And, and and a more recent one is Canada Goose. That that's that's been a fantastic one, and I think people people were were were, were you know 
particularly the last couple of years, um, viewing Canada Goose as, as really a, a fashion brand, a luxury brand, and, and they've got their roots in making, you know, highly technical outerwear for people originally in the in the Canadian Arctic. So um, for them, it was a it was a chance, I guess, to, to sort of to, to, to reinforce that, that, you know, the roots of their brand and the fact they're still making gear that will work in the toughest places on, on Earth. No, so in no. some ways, that, that's been a great endorsement. And then Bre- Bremont's been a fun one. You know, I, I, met, I met Nick and Giles, two founders, um, gosh, probably eight, years ago i guess and um and immediately i think i saw i saw two um kindred spirits they were guys who were taking on you know a a pretty challenging goal um a lot of people were saying it was impossible you know sort of taking on the giant swiss watchmaking brands yeah not not only that but then trying to bring watch manufacturing back to back to the uk um it seemed it seemed like an enormous challenge and they definitely they definitely weren't doing things the easy way and and you know, and neither neither was I I was I was aiming to, to head to Antarctica to try to finish this journey that had defeated Sir Ernest Shackleton it had you know, killed uh, Captain Scott so it had beaten two of the greatest icons you know uh, ever um, of polar exploration was still unfinished um, this idea of walking from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole back again so we just we just hit it off straight away and um, and for me um, you know, having, uh, I mean, with all of my equipment, none of it is extraneous. You know, I'm not taking any luxuries on these, on the expeditions. I'm, I'm dragging everything myself. So, so the gear, the clothing, the equipment I've got with me is all, it's all essential. And, um, and, and having a, an accurate timepiece is, is, is an interesting one because I, I'm in, I'm in a place where it is 24 hour daylight. There's no, yeah. You know, the sun just goes right around. There's no, there's no differentiation between day and night. Um, it's not obvious at all. So, and yet my entire life is 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 is, is quite regimented. It's governed by the clock, and by the time. I've got to, you know, as soon as I'm moving, I've got to stop and, and eat and drink at least every ninety minutes. Um, you know, things like logistics. If I if I'm being dropped off or picked up, the you know, timing is is crucial. Um, and these are also, as I've said, the coldest places on earth. And um, a lot of a lot of tech, um, you know, a lot of electronic battery powered technology really suffers in those in those conditions. In what way? Uh, what, what happens to it? Well, even even things like, for example, G- GPS is something I'm 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 totally reliant on. And and that's you know when you compare um, my equipment with 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 that of scott and shackleton you know just over a century ago that i think gps has been one of the big game changers and the, the other one is probably satellite communications you know having a sat phone and uh, being able to, to to call and email and, and whatever else but gps is, is is a game changer and um and i use a pretty basic you know garmin gps unit it's it's, it's almost a sort of bottom of the range you know c- consumer gps because i i don't need maps anything like that. i i just i just need numbers just latitude longitude and, and, and a compass bearing right. so um so and, and and the unit that I use is is powered by AA batteries, um, and uh, and you can get lithium batteries now, so they work okay in the cold. But anything with a anything with batteries, you need to look after it, keep it warm. Anything with an LCD screen, if it's very cold, the the screens become really sluggish and and and, and unreliable. Um, so GPS, so I keep it in a sort of inner pocket so, so it's relatively warm most of the time i can put it out and use it but um the watch i, I need to i need to look at every few minutes you know so so the watch lives um outside my jacket it's on a very long basis of long nato strap and um and lives over the sleeve of my jacket sort of under the the cuff of my mittens so i can just flip it up with so the I, I have i have a really important question okay watch guy to watch guy yeah, yeah. I've never done anything as seriously dangerous as polar exploration where if you screw up a calculation, if you go the wrong distance, if you if you do something wrong, you're going to die. And if you keep the wrong yeah. time, that can be problematic, especially if you're doing navigation by time if your GPS dies. Exactly. Um, yeah. Now, these are mechanical watches, and God mm-hmm. bless them, we love them, but they're not going to be as accurate as a digital watch. How often do you update the time on the watch? Just to make sure uh, it stays accurate, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I'm trying to think back to obviously the most recent expedition was, was November, December last year. Um, very rarely, I mean, I mean, yeah, probably probably two or three times in in, in two months. Okay. Um, so I, I mean, I I don't need you know accuracy to the to the second. You know, a, a couple of minutes here or there is 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 is, is fine if you're looking at your know, logistics and flights and that kind of thing. So it doesn't have to be have to be kind of pinpoint accuracy okay but, so um, not not the biggest but, worry so what's the biggest no, worry no. in gear failure 
when you're out there? What's the biggest wow. worry? Um, it's hard to pick one single thing. I mean, the, there are certain things. You know, the, I mean, the watch is key. If I can't, if I can't keep time, that's that's a big problem. Um, it's not necessarily a survival issue. I, I guess things like shelter. You know, the tent. If the tent gets ripped in a storm, if you're trying to put it up, that's that's a big problem. Um, Has that if, happened? If you, if, uh, no, luckily, I mean, t- touch wood, um, but it's a big fear. E- even things like even things like the failure of a zip, you know, if the door of the tent stops working, you know, if, you, if it gets jammed or tears somehow, you know, zip breaks, um, that, that, can, that can be a big problem. Okay, I have a um, question. I have, again, I, I, it's like if I don't get these questions in, you know, like I'm going to forget, but this, yeah, is big, okay, yeah. this is a big deal. <laughs> and my wife actually wanted to know this, and I was like, I was curious as well. Now, <laughs> you did this alone. You know, you have this yep. record, this solo journey record, which is fantastic. You have all the privacy that any human being could ever dream <laughs> to have. However, because of the inhospitable environment, as you called it, if you need to expose any part of your body, that's unbelievably dangerous. And yet, yep. from time to time... You definitely got to use the bathroom. You have what, to what's going on nature. with yeah, yes? Yeah. How do you do that without uh, endangering your um, you know livelihood yeah, uh, from a masculine no, perspective? <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> there's no real there's no real uh, trade secret to it. It's just uh, as quickly as possible, basically is is the is the short answer. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. N- number two is you try and you try and sort of get into a, into a routine, and and if it's if it's very cold, you can use the uh, the sort of porch of the tent last thing in the morning before you take the tent down. So so and just yeah dig a hole in the snow in the porch so that's relatively civilized um yeah but you need to pee you know f- several times a day and uh, i normally again i normally try and try and tie that in with get into a routine and try and tie that in with 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 stopping to eat and drink which is normally every every hour and a half or so um so yeah it's pretty you know back back to the wind and just and just go for it as, as quickly as you can <laughs> it's actually it's actually tougher on your on your hands on your fingers because you have to take off the, the these oh giant, of course that's horrible stuff. So, um, so yeah, the 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 the, uh, the the parts of my anatomy you might be concerned about don't, don't get a lot of exposure. So it's it's you just got to be pretty pretty quick. Okay, so it's not not the most pleasant time of day, even though no one's looking. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> um, where did you learn how to survive in extreme cold? You know, I remember I, I don't know how long ago the show was on, but I used to like this show that was by Les Stroud. This uh, oh yes. Uh, Les yeah, was yeah, always, yeah. for me, my favorite kind of uh, TV survivalist guy, and he specialized yeah. in staying alive in, you know, the northern parts of Canada. Yeah. And yeah. I remember something he said that seemed to make a lot of sense, but also very challenging is you have to, especially when it's cold, work very hard not to sweat. Yes. Is that no, true? Very true. Very true. Um, probably more so, more so in the Arctic than Antarctica. Antarctica, you get a bit, a bit of leeway because it, it's it's a, it's very dry. Technically, Antarctica is a desert, um, so uh, you can use, um, you know, for example, uh, in Antarctica, I, I use a down-filled sleeping bag. I use a big down, you know, duvet jacket that I put on when I stop to stay warm. But um, in the Arctic, there's a lot more humidity, so so down sleeping bags will, will over the course of a few weeks on an expedition will we'll start to fill with with ice, you know, from, wow. from condensation. So, so I have to use a synthetic bag in, in in the in the Arctic. So, uh, yeah, he's absolutely right, and and and, um, and I, you know, most people would mistakenly think that kind of keeping warm is the is the challenge. And in fact, I'm physically working really hard. I'm traveling on foot, wearing skis, you know, wearing a harness, dragging this sled with. Usually a huge amount of weight in it. You know, back in 2013, when we were setting the two of us were setting out to, to, to cover 1,800 miles in Antarctica, we were pulling 440 pounds each at the start. So, so, so it's like a it's like a sort of ultra marathon meets some crazy strongman event. So you're dragging this huge amount of weight, and it's you, you actually generate a lot of body heat. So the challenge often, as 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 Les put it, is isn't it's not staying warm, it's kind of regulating your temperature, making sure you, you don't sweat because if you start sweating profusely and everything gets damp and you and you stop uh, and it's cold and it's windy and you take ten minutes, you know, to sort of have a drink and some food and a you know and, and have a pee or whatever else, you get very, you know, dangerously cold very quickly. Interesting. Uh, um so so making sure that you're comfortable but not sweating is, is is key so um and and people are often surprised by how little i wear when i when i'm moving even in temperatures that are 20 30 degrees below freezing um you know normally it's just a, a sort of windproof outer shell and i mentioned canada goose who, who made that for my recent expedition last year um and then you have you know sometimes as little as one layer underneath just just a sort of base layer you know head right. to toe almost you know, thermals 
um, and, and a windproof well, that, shell over that the top. That captures uh, warm air so well. Exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. And then the shell itself will have, obviously it's got some zippers, not only on the front, but, but under the arms, you have a big pit zip, so you can sort of, the, there's a big hood with fur on the hood, so you, you can kind of, you can regulate temperature using 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 sort of vents and zips and, and whether the hood's up or down. Can, can I talk about Shackleton for a moment? Yeah, of course. Now, this is a name that you've probably had to say or hear probably more times than you want to, but he's definitely <laughs> a figure in the the history of guys like you um oh yeah why why was his failure so compelling to so many people wow well i think i think i think the legend of shackleton uh, well there's so, so there there are two there are two kind of british icons so there was there was shackleton and there was captain scott so so um and and i think the the, the fundamental difference between the two was that was that scott Died on on on, on an expedition in uh, 1912 in Antarctica, and Shackleton made it home, and 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 also brought all his men home alive from his last expedition, the the, the endurance. Um, so um, they were they're both extraordinary characters, and, and actually, I've come away from my own expeditions with with with, in some ways, with 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 a bit of insight into what it must have been like for these guys you know, a century ago, but um, in other ways, just an even greater sense of awe at, at what they achieved. Um, you know, back in back in I don't know when the Shackleton first set off here, you know, nineteen oh three or four, I think, on, on the Discovery expedition. Um, they were, you know, these guys were sailing away for for years at a time with 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 no hope of rescue, no communication. It's it's like it's like going to Mars. You know, they, when when Shackleton turned around short of the of the South Pole on his Nimrod expedition, I guess that must have been like nineteen oh eight. Um, he was he must have been 18 months travel away from home um which which to me is is just unimaginable wow. you know I, I i i i you know back in january i got from antarctica back to london in like four days i think um five days maybe so so, so yeah. and, Shack- and part, Shackleton, of that, part of that was a business class flight so, yeah. do you think if he would have had if you if you think he would have had like a jeep or a land rover on his mm. boat he would have used it well, funny enough, funny enough, they did. Um, someone, really? I, 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 yeah, I got into, I got into one of these kind of. I made the mistake of 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 of, of answering back to a troll on Instagram. Uh-oh. This was this last year or year before. Always, always uh, a fun idea. I put a, I put a photo up of a, of a of a vehicle Land Rover launching, and and some guy chimed in like, oh, you know, this, you know, what would Shackleton have said? You guys have sold out. You know, just this is ridiculous. It's all commercial nowadays. But what, where, where's where's the real true spirit of? exploration and adventure gone you know this is this is pathetic and 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 uh, and sh- one of shackleton's sponsors um on his his uh, his endurance expedition was a guy called william beardmore in fact he named uh, the beardmore glacier in, in antarctica after william beardmore now william beardmore had a had a, a car company and 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 shackleton took one of their cars down to antarctica <laughs> just just for a photo shoot yeah on the ice they didn't need so, so in some ways you know things haven't changed all that much it's the he best was, comeback he, ever exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> but then my then my fiance is like no you need to delete that you can't just just don't rise to the don't rise to the bait but uh, yeah you know, okay you so, know what here's the thing there there are trolls or just trolls and some of them have a point that it's like as annoying as it is you have to clarify you have to yeah, set, yeah, set yeah. the story straight Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, Shackleton was 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 heavily reliant on 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 sponsorship. You know, both from both from businesses and from and from private benefactors. So things, in many ways, things haven't changed all, all that much. Um, yeah, you know, the logistics are a bit simpler nowadays. I, I can fly down there. He had to yeah. sail, but they're Let, still they're still complex and expensive projects. Let's talk about science. I think mm. that. There was a lot of reasons people explored in the past. Most of it was money. They're looking for trade routes. They're looking for resources. They're looking for things to exploit. Um, and some people were looking to discover things about the natural world. Now, I don't know what your scientific background is. I'm sure you've, you're a curious person like many others. And you're in a place that not a lot of people go to do research. So it's, you might not have like a whole lot of hard data in front of you, but you see things. You see things change. You yeah. you go to a place that not a lot of people yeah. monitor. What have you learned about our natural world from being in a place that so few people go? Yeah, I, I think what I, I, first of all I, I should say I, I'm not I'm not an academic. I'm not a, I'm not a professional you know career climate scientist. Sure, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm I'm I'm, I'm a, you know a, a layman who has been motivated far more by by adventure than by I don't know kind of kind of you know academic um, uh, you know 
science field work that kind of thing um having said that i, I as as you point out I, I i'm a layman who's been lucky enough to have spent um you know many hundreds of days in 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 places that a lot of scientists won't get the chance to to, to visit so i think i think what i can bring to the and and the, and the big the big issue i think with 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 both the polar regions is 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 how they are changing and how profoundly they're changing certainly in, in recent years so i think what i can bring to that debate the climate change, climate change debate is 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 my labor perspective i'm not reliant on funding for research I'm not, i don't have any particular agenda to, that i want to approve or disprove so i can merely say look this is this is what i've seen in in since 2001, first time I went on, onto the Arctic Ocean um, from the north coast of, of, of Russia. Um, and it, it, it's clear to me that things are changing. Um, it's more obvious um, in the Arctic for sure. And, and, and the, the challenge and the big difference between the North Pole and the South Pole, the South Pole is in the middle of a continent. Antarctica is a massive bit of land. It, 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 it's the size of America and Mexico put together. It's a yeah. huge, huge place. The size of China and India put together, massive continent. The North Pole is in the middle of the sea. It's in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. So if you're trying to get there on foot, you're, you're traveling over the frozen, well, the semi-frozen surface of the Arctic Ocean. So, so, so the change in the Arctic um, has been far more obvious at, at first hand. Um, because of all is, the ice in the water. Exactly. It, it, it's literally getting thinner. Um, yeah. The extent you know, is, is, is decreasing every year. So, so that is obvious to the to the naked eye um antarctica is interesting i mean when i was down there last year it was it was unusually warm um and you might think that would make things easier for me but actually it was it was a nightmare it, it meant a lot of uh, cloud a lot of snow uh, a lot of, well i mean it sounds weird complaining about snow in antarctica but um but, but a lot of a lot of the kind of snow that you'd expect, I don't know, in, in, in the Alps or, or in you know, Colorado, so this kind of fluffy, you know, wet. No, normally snow in Antarctica is very, very fine, very icy, very dry. And, and I had a lot of really sticky, wet snow, uh, a lot of cloud, a lot of fog, a lot of mist. So very, very poor visibility. Um, so actually, the warmer temperatures have, have really hampered my, my progress last year. It was really, really challenging. That's that's interesting. So, you know, I mean, obviously, there's even a conversation about that. But I think what's interesting is that you're seeing something happen rapidly. It's obvious to the eye, whereas a lot mm. of other places you live, it's much more difficult to notice things because you don't always know what you see, yet you're yes. seeing something that just is so obviously changing, as though a color was changing or something was diminishing or increasing in size. These are things that the human eye can determine very easily and are not. You don't requ it doesn't require an expert opinion to be like, it looks smaller this year. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and interestingly, yeah, my, my, my first... North Pole expedition back in 2001 we were there were two of us we were able literally to walk from the the, the sort of northernmost bit of land there's, a, there's a, a chain of islands off the north coast of Russia called Seven Islands Emilia and we were out there in early Mar late February early March 2001 and we were able to literally walk off these islands onto the frozen surface of the sea um, I went back to the same place in 2004 and there was there were several miles of open water uh, and uh, and people say oh it's a freak here it'll, it'll be back to normal next year and it's never been back to normal since. There's been more and more open water every year. So, so where there was once solid ice um, yeah. every spring, now now there's 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 open open ocean. So it's 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 yeah, it's obvious to naked eye. And um, the same in Greenland. You see some of the big big glaciers there just retreating very quickly, and just it's obvious even even over the space of several years, like the changes is obvious. Yeah. Um, so things are definitely changing. Um, and but I I'm not I'm the least qualified person to comment on exactly why yeah. that's happened. You what, know, how much it is, it what, made, but, uh, what are some other potential scientific uh, reasons or values from these types of things you do? And the, and the reason I ask is, you know, you're a role model to a lot of people. They they look at what you do and they want to find reasons to to do things like traverse very difficult, hard to reach places. <laughs> that you know, again, the irony is they're empty and great because they're hard. And if too many people try, then it's no longer as empty and great. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, d give some people some like reasons they might not think that there's scientific, cultural, artistic value to what mm. you're doing. Like, should more people do what you're doing and, and take pictures? Like, how should the types of journeys you use be better exploited by the general public? Wow. Um, I, I think I think one of the things I, I, I hope I've been able to do, and, and this is certainly going to be more of a focus in the future, is 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 kind of telling 
the story of places that very few people will ever see, will ever get a chance to visit, um, will, you know, will, ever, will ever see with their own eyes. Uh, and yet they are places that will have a profound effect on, on all of our lifetimes, certainly in the next few decades. Um, if, if, if the climate keeps changing as it does, then, then, then it's, it, it, it can't not have an effect on, on, on all of our lives, on the weather that, that affects all, you know, all of us. So, um, so I think, and I think um, you can't expect people to feel a sense of stewardship towards the, the, the environment unless they have some kind of emotional connection with it. So I hope that that's through, through the kind of storytelling that I've done, that that's, that's one of the things I can do and one of the things I can bring this. Um, and that's definitely, I, I've got a, I can't say too much because we haven't, we haven't, uh, I haven't even started pitching this project yet, but this is a few years down the line, but I, I really want to take a, a group of young people to Antarctica and, and, and document um, a particular area. There's a, there's a big mountain range across the middle and, and just to try to sort of tell this story through, through young people's eyes, they'd, they'd probably be in, in, you know, teenagers um, and, and to try to, you know, make a film, to produce some art, do some writing, do some photography um, and to, to, to try and, yeah, try and try and sort of document this place um, in, in, in as uh, rich a, a detail as we can, and to share the story with, with as many people as we, as we can. So, so you, I think want, a story... you want to be a guide, to a degree, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's, I mean, this is this is this is an idea that's bubbling away for the next couple of years. But um, no, I'd it's love a, to it's a great, it's a it's a great idea. Um, you <laughs> set you set a record. You set a few records. Tell me about the record you set. Yeah, so the, the the big one was yeah the the biggest was uh, back in 2013 2014 there were two of us on, on that expedition um, we we basically walked from the coast of Antarctica to the South Pole and then back to the coast again so it was an 18 1800 mile round trip 108 days in total and uh, we we broke the record or we set the record for the, the the longest longest ever polar journey on foot so the longest human powered polar expedition uh, 1800 miles in fact 1801 exactly. Um, and uh, and that was yeah I think I think looking back that's my proudest achievement and um, I coming back to science yeah one of the things one of the things that that I'm really interested in is is, is sort of human performance so the kind of athletic side of this the the, the, the fitness the training the nutrition um, and I just had a just had a note this week from a guy a, you know UK so a former government scientist who is who is uh, working on on kind of keeping humans healthy on on missions to Mars. So that kind of stuff really intrigues me, and I think in some ways we've 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 been good guinea pigs. We were eating, you know, freeze dried food for you know, for three and a half months. How was it? We had no no. no uh, it was it was better than you'd probably imagine, but um, yeah, there was no, we had no fresh fruit or vegetables. There's, there's nothing living in Antarctica. It's a giant white. Yeah, the, the you, only life. Can you if you melt around, the snow? Like, can you drink it? Yeah, absolutely, and that, and that's that's the only way we can get drinking water. So we have to every morning, every evening in the tent, uh, we, we we melt snow to get water. So that's how it works. Interesting. Um, danger. You returned before you completed your last journey because you thought it would be a good idea to stay alive. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you've had people close to you perish doing uh, this thing that you all love that you know is dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Have you ever thought to yourself? Um, this was fun as a kid, but like I'm getting too old for this. I don't want to. I don't want to have my family <laughs> lose me to, because I'm an extreme athlete. Yeah, I mean, I, I, as you said, I I, I stopped. Um, you know, my plan last year was to make a solo crossing of Antarctica, so walking from one side to the South Pole to the opposite side um, on my own, unsupported. No one's ever done that. Um, a good friend of mine um, uh, died at the end of it. Well, he 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 he, he was rescued um, at yeah. the end of a. a an attempt uh, two years ago and, and died in hospital in Chile a couple of days later. Um, he, yeah, he, he, he had a ruptured stomach ulcer. So he died of peritonitis and um, I, I think there were a few kind of pre-existing factors, but it is, yeah, it's, it's, it, these are, these are, um, you know, journeys un undertakings that are not without risk. And, um, and someone asked me last year when I was down there, I did an interview on the satellite phone. And they said, it was his memory, you know, kind of spurring me on. And I said, if anything, it's, it's actually encouraging me to, Play it safe, and to realise that 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 getting home in one piece is is the most important goal here. And um, you know, I got in, I got engaged last summer, so getting married next month. And and, and I think that I th thank you. And I think I think that I think that definitely changed my appetite for risk and my and my feeling of responsibility to to to, to those at home. So I don't I don't yet have a family, don't have kids yet, but that's definitely part of the part of the, the plan. So um I think again that that might change things further. So um and I, I also feel particularly after the trip we did in twenty 
2013, 2014. Like I, I kind of feel like I feel pretty content in, in, in a way that I haven't for years. So, so I kind of, I feel like I've, I've scratched this itch in, in terms of, I don't know, personal accomplishment. And, and, and I think like the next chapter is going to be far more about telling the story of these places and, and, and the kind of legacy that I want to leave. So, um, so I, I, I kind of feel that I've taken the, you know, the kind of record breaking endurance challenge, you know, solo trips or small teams. I, I kind of taken that as far as I wanted to. So I feel at the moment, anyway, I may come back to eat these words, but um, at the moment I feel pretty content with what I've what You're going to, you're going to have like a midlife crisis and be like, I want to go under the, under the ocean and like, you exactly, know, walk, exactly. walk underwater. Yeah. One of those like <laughs> old style diving bell suits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I'll new be, extreme I'll be, yeah, sport. Surrounded by I'll be surrounded by like screaming kids, and I'll be like, right, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm going back, like dust, dust off the sledge. <laughs> Look, you know that 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 happens. It's a it's a great escape, and there's sort of a, a nobility to it, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we shall see. Yeah, watch this, watch this space. <laughs> so you get to say that you're a a speaker now, uh, hopefully also a paid speaker, and you have TED talks. Yep. Um, how'd you how'd you get into doing that, and what's it like being um. I guess in a lot of ways, a a, a motivator. You are um you mm. are there to inspire people and make them feel like they can do tough stuff, even if it has nothing to do with the thing that you did. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. That I that I sort of thought, well, I'm going to do a couple of exhibitions and, and get on speaking circuit. That sounds that sounds lucrative. Like I, I didn't realize it even existed when you were like 20, 23 years old, my first experience. And also I was, I was a shy kid. Like if you told me as a teenager that I would be making my living standing up in front of often hundreds, occasionally more than a thousand people at a time with no notes and speaking, you know, on my own on the stage for 45 minutes, I, I would never have believed you. So, um, so, so, so I, this definitely wasn't like, the, the, the sort of master plan that I've had for years. I, I, I stumbled into it. And to start with, I guess, 15, 16 years ago, it was schools originally, uh, you know, s- scout groups, charities, you know, but just, I just started getting invited to speak after my first one or two expeditions. And, um, and to my surprise, I quite enjoyed it, but, but partly because I guess what I do is so weird that to get any experts in the room, so so so, it's not, yeah. so I, usually I'm I, I'm the expert on the subject matter, and, and that's that gives you a bit of confidence. And um, and I just people's response to it was was so great that that I just just started to really enjoy telling the story of what I was doing and what I was planning to do and what, you know, what I experienced, what I'd seen, um, and it kind of grew from there really. So so and and then TED was was a real turning point. So I I, I was asked to speak at TED first of all in 2005, which was. Before they started putting talks online, it was all very low key. It was one one event per year. Um, TED had, had already been going then for for oh gosh nearly, nearly twenty years, I guess. But um, but it was um, it was pretty a pretty low key event with some extraordinary people there. But um, it was a that was a real turning point for me. And then on the back of that, I started getting invited to speak, you know, for for bigger you know, corporate events. And um, and I guess. You know, my, 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 my toes always curl when I'm introduced as a, as a, as a motivational speaker because I, I think people expect me to, like, to come running onto the stage like some kind of Tony but Robbins But you, you run, right? You don't walk. You run on stage. <laughs> I, I, you have to I, run. I, 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 I rarely run on stage. I'm always worried about, like, tripping up on the stage. <laughs> and my face. And, yeah. um, and I, I, I'm definitely not a kind of, you know rock music pumping in the background kind of yeehaw like I, I don't see myself as a sort of motive in that respect but, but I, I do I do hope that there is some food for thought in 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 my story which is which is essentially you know here's this goal that I had you know from, from a pretty early age um, everyone said it was impossible it had never been done before and and we did it and and, and here's what I figured out along the way and and, and actually it's a story about you know, predictable themes. It's, it's hard work. You know, focus, dedication, self belief. You know, getting the right people around you, the right, the right, the right team, um, and and refusing to give up even even when things sound hopeless. So, okay, so, so, kind of- so answer answer a question for this audience, and this is a mm-hmm. question that you you asked and answered. Why bother yeah. leaving the house? Why, Ben? Tell me why. Yeah, why bother leaving the house? Well, it's 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 it's, it's a very good question. I was. Uh, 
uh, a couple months ago, it was it was we had a bit of snow here in London, which which doesn't happen that often. And um, and I remember sort of sat in my living room looking outside, thinking, God, it looks looks miserable out there. Like, why would you, why would anyone want to go and spend a yeah, 108 nights in a tent? You know, colder than this. So uh, it's a very valid question, and and and, um, and I think particularly as as you know the the media that we have access to becomes more and more immersive. You know, and and, and I was at TED in Vancouver a couple of weeks ago, and, and just some of the stuff that's being demoed there now, the kind of virtual reality technology is is part of me loves that. Like part of me is a huge geek, and part of me finds it quite spooky. As 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 a kid who was lucky enough to grow up in a fairly rural area, you know, southwest of the UK, I was outdoors. All the time as a, as, a, as, a, as a kid, you know, climbing trees and swimming the river, and you know, so I had I had a I realized now, having lived in London for for twenty years, I realized I was pretty lucky as as a kid to be outside as much as I as I was, and um, for me, the outdoors has been um, it's been uh, I don't really have to describe it. Like I was never as a school kid, I was never inspired by anything that happened in a classroom. Like, the, to me, the exciting stuff happened outdoors. The adventures were all out, outside. Um, and, um, and that's held true for the, for the, for the, you know, the, the entire course of my life, really. So um, to me, um, the outdoors has been, has been a place where I've, where I've been able to challenge well, there, myself. There's, like a, there's a happiness that I think, like you, I only feel when I'm outside. Like, you can never yeah. be as happy inside as you are outside. Exactly. There's a lovely concept um, in Japan, um, something called Shinrin Yoku, which is, I think it translates as forest bathing. And I'm pretty sure. <laughs> That's I'm such pretty a great sure, translation. It's lovely. And, I, and I'm pretty sure it is prescribed by doctors. Like if you are some, you know, Tokyo, you know, tech worker or financier or whatever, and you, and you are stressed out and overworked and, and spending, you know, working 70 hours a week, they will, they will prescribe Shinrin Yoku, which basically means like leave your phone at home, go for a walk in the woods. You know, and and um, and I'm a great believer in that. I think there's something there's something really profound about spending time a- outdoors. In, it's in very nature. practical and it works. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I I live in Los Angeles, and you know, it's a big city, but I feel fortunate that within reasonable di- uh, driving distance, sometimes only 20 minutes, I can get yeah. out and be in nature and not have to see any developed anything in any direction, even if there's a hill absolutely. covering it. And I absolutely. do it as yeah. often as I can as I can because um, it, it's kind of like recharging your batteries mm, mm, I completely agree and uh, my, you know, my, my brother is a geography teacher he now, he now lives and, and teaches in, in Switzerland but um, he started his career in London at, and, and teenagers who'd never left that bit of London, so they'd never seen a hill or a valley. Like they, they were sort of abstract concepts. So, so to me, there's a real tragedy there. And, and of course, I, I think you've got no hope of of of, of getting that that you know, kids like that inspired about the environment when they have no literal connection with it. So, um, I think yeah, I think that, that that on so many levels, it is it's it's absolutely vital to us as 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 a, as a species to to spend time outdoors in nature. Now, I know a lot of the TED talks, they. Um you know they're, they're futurists. They're trying to predict the future, and there's you know utopian and dystopian views of the future. And and you know some of the dystopian ones are, are scary. You know like uh, plants aren't going to be able to grow, and the natural world isn't going to be undeveloped. And um, you know do you agree with the idea that while we still have na- a natural world, we should document it and protect it as much as possible? Because eventually, given the rate we're at, it's not going to last forever. Um. um yeah. I also think, interestingly, coming back to the kind of space analogy, like Antarctica is a is a kind of interesting case study in in how we might approach different planets, like new planets, because no one owns Antarctica. It's it's governed by a treaty, like it it hasn't been claimed by a single nation. Like it's 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 it's, it's all kind of governed very democratically, and and um, mm. and it's set aside for for science, and you know, no one can exploit it commercially. There's no there's no drilling, no mining, even though we know there are enormous resources down there so i think it's an interesting example of and and and, you know the antarctic treaty um runs until 2041 so it's gonna be interesting to see how how that carries on afterwards um but um so i think there's there's a there's a kind of case china's got something to say about that oh yeah i'm sure yeah (laughs) (laughs) just say it so uh, yeah so 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 yeah so i i i'm i think also i'm a i'm a i'm a I'm an optimist, and I'm a I'm a I'm a geek. You know, I'm a believer in 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 in, in sort of progress and, and technology and innovation and, and kind of working working out these challenges we're we're facing as a as a, as a, you, but, know, as a but you know let let's let's say that as 
a society, we decide that these are pl parts of the Earth, especially you know Antarctica, which is landmass. Um, it's time to start developing there. Like, yeah. what do you, what do you think would make sense there that would have the least negative impact? Or maybe that's I mean, like, can we generate energy out there? Is there wave action? Like, like what is uh, what's a good use of that place? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I there's enormous energy. I mean, there's there's it's it's for half the year it has 24 hour daylight. Um, it's the it's the windiest place on on earth um the uh, you know the southern ocean which surrounds it has has some of the biggest waves on earth and and so I, yeah there's there's extraordinary natural energy out there that, that could be harnessed um you know and and i think we, you know we we know that there are that there are big resources there, there there's there's oil there's gas there's coal precious metals there's there's a lot of stuff there that that, that humans are, are hungry for but um i yeah we, we, we I think I think the the treaty is pretty rock solid, and, and and I think the way it's worded is 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 that if one if one of the six nations like objects, then the, the treaty kind of has to be renewed. So um, so I think it's pretty. I think Antarctica is safe, and um, I'd like to think so. It's, it's kind of there's something special about an entire continent that that is 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 pretty much untouched. It's um, like your own private th nature reserve with not, it's, without it's, that much it's, nature. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I often say if you've seen if you've seen a documentary about Antarctica, you've been misled. You know, like they're full of penguins and and seals and sea lions and your birds and yeah. No, it's the only the certain only, places yeah, around the coast. It's only only around only around the coast. Like the yeah. only life in Antarctica that comes out of the sea. So for the most part, it's a giant white desert. But um, but there's something very special. You know, I, I I spent fifty two days um last year down there and and saw nothing man made. Like n zero, no buildings, no aircraft, no vehicles, no roads. No What's nothing. that feel like after five days? It's <laughs> it's it's so hard to put into words. I mean, there's something there's something pretty magical about it, and um, in some ways, in some ways, it can be um, quite oppressive. Like like especially when the weather's bad and the, and the cloud closes in, you can't see a thing all day long. It can be quite frustrating. But when the weather's good, and especially when there's some scenery, um, you know, the first three weeks or so I was I was in the mountains near the coast and it's just beautiful and um, the knowledge that the last person that had been there was my friend Henry yeah two years before um, the last person that had seen these these entire mountain ranges was, was Henry that that was that was pretty special that's that's okay so that that's I mean that's a great feeling but you know I think that over time as people have more access and again as places warm up and there's less of a deterrence to go there uh the coastline especially has got to have more traffic and visitors do you ever see signs of other people going around the coastline like or even trash uh very little i mean antarctica it's, it's interesting that there have been some there have been some headlines about sort of growing tourism in antarctica and and and, and, and you know how well it's being managed and and it is. It's got to be one of the most closely, tightly regulated places on on Earth in terms of in terms of um, you know how how you can get there and what you can do there. Um, even getting on the air, aircraft to fly down, they have um, um, uh, I'm trying to we call it, but uh, but it's just sort of. Um, plastic trays of of of, of uh, i guess it's some kind of pesticides to make sure that you don't have any grass seeds or anything in like in the soles of your boots that you that you might take to antarctica or any bacteria or so wow. so um, everything that goes down there is, is is you know is is sterilized so it's, it's extraordinary um and, and and the visitor numbers compared to the size of the place are tiny i, th I think I think maybe it's 40, 40 dead people last year for Antarctica, including scientists, and um, and it's yeah, it's twice the size of Australia. It's a massive, yeah, massive continent. So um, I, I, I think um, uh, I think it's it's important that people can visit Antarctica and and, and and will hopefully come away with with you know as as advocates for for, for uh, looking after this place. Now you know, again, what you do is a type of uh, sport that uh, is very life threatening, and you have been able to appreciate the fragility um, of life as well as the sort of determination mm. and, and durability of life. Um, what about the sort of human machine impresses you the most after your multiple journeys into this environment that is, you know, really not <laughs> really not for what we're designed to do? Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's it's. Uh... It comes back, and then this was this was Shackleton's family motto: "You know, through endurance we conquer." And I think it's just our, our endurance. I um, occasionally, um, 
you know, I, 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 was, I ran the London Marathon um, weekend before last, and uh, I was sort of training for that, and just, and just thinking, you know, I turned, I turned 40 last year, and, and touch wood so far have been relatively, like my knees seem to be okay still, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, I've got a slight sense of disbelief now that I've, I've covered, you know, nearly four and a half thousand miles on, on foot um, in the Arctic and Antarctica. Yeah, my, my knees have done a fair bit of, fair bit of mileage, and they still, still seem to be going strong at the moment. So what, do just, the, what do the doctors say about that? Out of curiosity. Um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, we, I did a lot of lot of testing uh, when I came back from Antarctica in uh, in 2014 from that from that big 1800 mile journey. Oh, sorry, we've got an alarm going off. I'm just going to close this close this door. Two seconds. I think they're just testing testing a fire. It's, I hope it's, it's testing it's a fire. Okay. <laughs> you, you've probably seen um, the more alarming things in your day. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I did, we, we did a lot of testing when I came back in 20, 2014 uh, because I was, as you'd expect, I was pretty exhausted having come back from three and a half months of dragging a sledge around the you know, coldest place on earth. Um, but it took me longer to recover than I, than I thought. And um, and we did some interesting research into, into sort of what had happened, like how sort of burnt out my my body was in terms of you know, on a kind of physical like hormonal level like they'd be, they'd be some quite big changes so it took it took a while to to get back to normal after that after that expedition which as i said was 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 69 marathons back to back you know pulling 440 pounds at the start so you, you'd expect <laughs> to feel feel pretty tired when you come home from that what, what, so what do you know <laughs> about maintaining fitness and you know uh i'll just say good health that you've <laughs> learned through all this that you really wish more of the general public know. Oof, um, that's a good question. I would say, like my train, my training in a way. It's, it's it's interesting that things like CrossFit are huge now, um, because I've always had to be a, a sort of jack of all trades, fitness wise. Like I've always been a runner and a cyclist and a skier and a hiker, and 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 I've always lifted weights. Like there's there's always been a kind of strength component to to to, to my expeditions as well to to be able to pull the sledge. So. So in hindsight, that that kind of combination of of, of um, different types of physical training has served me really well, and I think that's how I've sort of carried on going for as long as I have, you know, seventeen year career now, um, without any real problems with with injury. Um, so I think I think it's yes, yeah, it's a sort of balance really. Like I haven't just been an obsessively keen runner, you know, or an obsessively keen cyclist. And I think, I think, or an obsessively keen weightlifter. Cause I think in, in any, if you just specialize in one of those disciplines, yeah, you can take them extraordinary, you know, to extraordinary heights, but, um, but you become a pretty, pretty weird sort of individual. You know, I've got friends who are competitive cyclists and, and, uh, you know, uh, the idea of going, I don't know, going hill walking with them and take carrying a heavy pack is just, is unthinkable. <laughs> like they have zero, zero upper body strength. So I, I kind of, I think, like balance is, is, has been really important, um, and uh, and and now now I'm in my fifth decade, I guess. Uh, like recovery is becoming more important as well. So I have yeah, if I'm recovery training, recovery meaning resting yeah, just, between. And what yeah, do you, what do you do during recovery? Like, what's the secret yeah. to actually recovering? I I, I, I swear by um, like proper sports massage. So if if I'm training for an expedition, I have a weekly massage and 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 like proper deep tissue like elbows fists you know like like i have a, a russian lady in london who, who does my sports massage so i think that's been a really for me really key thing and it's often highlighted like like what could become injury like if i've got, if I've got some kind of tight area somewhere like it's, it's always been a really good early, early warning system um so yeah just it, it, not enough rest um just looking after yourself yeah kind of massage and sauna if i can or or uh, you know, just getting enough sleep has often been a challenge because I tend to, I think like you, I tend to be a bit of a night owl and I find it's, it's easier to work at night when it's, when it's quiet, no interruptions. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's often this kind of macho temptation to, to kind of go, go, you know, I, oh, I can get by with five hours sleep or six hours sleep or whatever. <laughs> and I think that, that doesn't work out so well. So, um, yeah, I, I probably sleep more now than I was 10 years ago. Do you sleep, did you sleep full nights when you were doing your trekking? Yeah, I did last year. Now, back in 2013, 2014, we were we had a really tight time window. We were trying to cover this huge distance, and there's there's quite a tight season. So so we weren't sleeping enough on that trip, and I think that's one of the big differences. That that's why it took so long to recover. We were we were sleeping five or six hours a night um, for three and a half months, and we were doing often nine or ten hours of exercise. <laughs> You know, every every day. So um, 
we came back um yeah f- properly burnt out and uh, last year out there solo for two months um i slept a lot more i slept for seven or eight hours every night um and slept well and and and, and that was a, a big difference in terms of my performance so um yeah it's important you can't uh, sadly i have a way to, to compress that yeah. <laughs> um you know dur- going back to the resting period i think it's interesting you say that because i don't think a lot of people understand the concept very well i mean they understand rest but they don't really understand what's going on. what is your body actually doing is it repairing is it replenishing nutrients like what's going on exactly yeah it's 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 a sort of combination of the two really it's 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 kind of rebuilding itself and and um people often assume that 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 you know fitness comes through training through physical exercise and that that's actually not the case at all like exercise kind of wears you down you know sort of um and and if you don't recover properly then and then you'll you'll break yourself so so fitness is, is this kind of um sort of upward curve if you, if you do it properly that there's a series of steps so every time you train hard you're actually wearing yourself down and then your body recovers so so um so it's 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 the most important um component of, of, of fitness really uh, of any fitness program is 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 recovering properly um, otherwise, you're going to be ill or injured or overtrained or, or all three. And did you learn this because you studied athletics, or is this so, is something that you sort of pick up on the job, so to say? It's yeah, a bit of a bit of both. And I think also as I got older, you you kind of realise like I could get away with things in my twenties that I couldn't get away with now, like 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 training and partying and drinking and yeah, not sleeping enough and yeah, that just doesn't work nowadays. So right. So. Um, I think I've, I've just realized it's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's vitally important. To, and especially if you're trying to be, trying to stay fit and trying to stay athletic, you know, in, into your forties as I am now, it's, it's one of the most important parts. So as you get older, we are allowed to develop more discriminating tastes. And, you know, in my sphere with, with the audience that we reach, we're, we're people that like watches. And as we sort of mature and get more watches, we want, more and more of a certain type of watch and less and less of something else. Um, I guess you sort of have to be professionally Spartan when you are exploring and on one of these great adventures. But uh, in your day-to-day life, what over the years have you become more and more discriminating about? Where, where, what are you a snob about? Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, what am I a snob about? I, well, I'm getting. I told you I'm getting married. Or is this a good, so better question for your wife or your wife no, to well, be? Yeah, probably pretty good. Yeah. For her. I, I think. I think food. I, I, I'm. I'm. Uh, yeah. Someone. Someone sent me an article recently. Um, it was a sort of parody thing about about uh, Whole Foods, and it was. And we have. A, I live in Richmond in London. We have a Whole Foods just down the road, and uh, and it was. It was something about people that wore Patagonia and drove Range Rovers. You know, and I was. I'm sponsored by Land Rover. I was driving a Range Rover. I, you know, <laughs> I've got a lot of a lot of out, outdoor gear in my wardrobe. So I was like, oh yeah, I, I totally fit that that uh, that cliched you know, stereotype. But yeah, food. Uh, food. I've become a snob about for sure. Um, I mean, I'm quite interested in, in nutrition anyway obviously but um but in like eating organic and eating healthily I, I i definitely that's become more important so so i'm a i'm a food snob i'm a bit of bit of a coffee i, I don't take it too far but i'm a, a bit of a snob like i <laughs> grind beans and make coffee yeah i think caffeine is one of my real vices nowadays so um and i'm i'm a bit of a i'm a bit of a clothes snob and i think that probably comes from the fact that on expeditions i'm i'm wearing the same the same thing like i don't look in a mirror for, for months at a time so and i don't have to like put on a suit and tie for my job so actually i quite i quite enjoy dressing up i quite enjoy well, you, I'm having you, a... you present yourself in front of people when you publicly speak like this is true. it's part this of your brand so of course yeah you care. exactly yeah yeah and i'm having a yeah having a suit made for the for the for the, for the wedding and and uh and um yeah i'm enjoying that process um yeah huntsman and Savile Row. sorry my okay dog's... Okay. Last last question uh, mm-hmm. for the watch people. Uh, tell us about your status as a watch guy, watch collector. Um, what what do you uh, and what do you wish the uh, a, a functionality that could be built into a watch could be that you know might help you on a future quest? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm just going to close this door to my dog. Yeah, yeah. Two, two, two seconds. Shush, Sorry. The, the... I think the doorbell just rang and the dog came bananas. Um, what would I, what what functionality would I wish for in a in a watch? Um, 
Gosh. Well, I mean, Bremont kind of did it with the with the well, with the turnover originally, and then with the endurance recently. Like they they there were two things. What one is that I'm obsessed by saving weight. Like the lighter the sledge is, the less I'm carrying, the higher my chance of success. So right. so I was uh, yeah back in 2012, I was like, could could, we, could you do a titanium watch? They they didn't, hadn't done one at the time, and um and uh, Nick English was like, yeah, I, I think we probably could. Um, and sure enough, they've, they've made one. So we've got these two, you know, titanium case watches. Um, so they're much lighter than the than the, the submarine that it's based on. Um, and they have a 24 hour hand. It makes navigating easier. What, what would I? Mm, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I, it, it, it's probably complete travesty. But maybe maybe having some kind of like I, I, I if, if I run, I use a GPS watch. Like I run with a Garmin watch. So I so I, I track and. and all my all my training and upload it and i'm real geek about that so so maybe one day this may be like a like a few years down the line but maybe maybe kind of combining the two having a this fantastic kind of analog mechanical watch but maybe secretly having some way of tracking you know gps you know tracking distance and time and pace and things like that that, that'd be cool so you you kind of represent the sort of the other side of the the privacy question you're like yeah i i I understand i'm being tracked but i want to be because it keeps me alive Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I deliberately have a have a you know device in my in my sledge that is pinging out my position every every hour. Like you know, I, I, you know, I'm pretty keen for people to know where I am. Are you familiar with the sort of famous Breitling emergency watch? Uh, I I am. Um, now I, I I think part of me thinks it's fantastic. I actually took one on an expedition back in 2001, my very first expedition, and. Um, the challenge with the emergency is it has batteries in it, and it doesn't it doesn't like being left outside in the in the cold. Right. So it has batteries for the for you know, for the transmitter, and I think it may, I forget if it has a, a digital like if there's if there's a if there's a sort of a quartz component to it as well. I can't remember. Yeah, but, they, so, they've since come out with a new one that's a lot more durable. But you're right, the older one was susceptible to that stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, but it was, it was, and I was also really worried. I remember wearing it around London and sort of wearing it on the tube, and just so worried that people were going to try and would, would know what it was and would try and pull out the antenna and you know trip the alarm. So, so uh, yeah, that's was, your city. That's what people do. Well, no, no, it never actually happened. But I was just, I was worried about that. Like I felt paranoid wearing it to the pub or something. Um, so, uh, yeah. what, what, what do you like about Brema? It's a watch brand. I mean, you've been exposed to other watch brands. I mean, I think it's a good mm. question. People, people are just like, oh yeah, there's a bunch of payola and being ambassador. I'm like, hold your horses, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, well, there, there, there's, it's, it, it, there has been much money. They're, they're pretty small brands. So but it, it works was... best when ambassador <laughs> likes brand and brand likes ambassador. That's when Absolutely. it works best. Absolutely, and I think I think for for me, it's the fact that 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 even though they're growing pretty fast, um, you know, I spoke at an event last week up in the north of England, a city called Leeds, alongside Giles English, like one of the founders. Like that's not going to happen with a with a Rolex or an Omega or a, or a Breitling. You, you like the the the, the customers are not going to have that kind of contact with the guys that created the business. So I love the fact that it still feels like a kind of family firm you know it's still it's still a smaller company yeah, that they, they have they, that they do a good job and look i gotta say you know retailers will tell you this <clears throat> in america and brands don't always don't always do it but it's a relationship business there's Absolutely. a lot of good options for five or ten thousand dollars when you want a nice yeah. watch the one you get is the brand that makes you feel special yeah, completely agree yeah yeah and i think i think from my like personal point of view is I, I just really admire what Nick and Giles have done like they, they they definitely did not follow the path of least resistance like they've worked damn hard to to, to build what they have and um, I think they've proved a lot of people wrong along the way so so part of me really respects that and can kind of identify with that so I feel like they're they're in many ways they are kind of kin- kindred spirits and um yeah and they, and they make a product that that uh, you know hasn't hasn't let me down in uh I mean, I, I try to work out how many expeditions now. Probably, probably five expeditions wearing Bremont. Um, yeah, you and know, and, and, sub- and that doesn't surprise me. That you, mm. you, you have basically gone in as in as dangerous a place as possible. Um, and your watch was reliable to you, and all that—that's all that you need to be a fan. You're like, you know what? Exactly. The, the the product worked real well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing wrong with so, that, you that's, know. That's the, that's the yeah the the ultimate endorsement I can give really. Is, yeah. That's what you should do. You went next time to the event, and they're just like, "Why do you like the brand?" You're like, "Well, um, I wore it when if I didn't have it, I may have been seriously uh, injured or die or be lost, and it didn't break time and time again, and so that's why I'm standing here." Boom, that's it. 
exactly. <laughs> Nailed it. And that's and that's it. Okay, uh, Ben, thank you so much for this uh, this interesting conversation. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Ariel. Yeah, yeah. Um, everyone is Ben Saunders. You can check out all of his stuff. And Ben, where are you going next? Uh, where am I going next? Uh, not nothing very exotic coming up. I'm getting married on the first of June, so that is the that's the next adventure. Um, beyond that, we we shall see. I'm, I'm writing a book this year, so that's that's uh, the uh, the current challenge. Um, and it's a sort of memoir, looking back on on yeah, 17 years of expeditions, 12 big polar trips. So uh, no rush. Busy writing, busy writing that. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm doing. I'm I'm just about to sign up for a race in the UK called the Dragon's Back which is uh, five days right across Wales. It's uh, They call it the toughest mountain running race in the world. So wow. um, that's my next chance. A bit closer to home, but um, it's going to be pretty pretty epic. So that's uh, uh, a year's time, May, May next okay. year. Okay, next time we speak, you'll have to tell me how that went, okay? Absolutely. I look forward right. to it. All right, thanks, Ben. Fantastic. Thank